just thought it, 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 it was so wrong. And um, I wanted I wanted to make the movie in New York, which I did, I did but I wanted to produce it and write the screenplay, and I wanted the original cast. Because I thought it was better if, if, if people came in out of the rain, like tonight, and just sat down and saw all these people they'd never seen before in their life, that by the end of the movie they would love them or hate them. Mm -hmm. And you, they would have pre, pre, predetermined notions about very famous uh, actors. Do you think... Uh, by the way, more. Uh, was the only one that CVS, which is cinema-centered films, as you saw in the beginning with Cold War to seeing the original track of uh, Anything Goes, goes yeah. Uh, uh, they gave me everything, but I had, I had my list of what I wanted, and it included Bob Moore to uh, direct the film. And they just said, well, no, that's the one thing that we just will not give in on. You're going to have to get somebody who's made a movie before because, we, you know, you've got a budget and you've got a certain time to do it in. And we need somebody who knows what they're doing. So uh, enter Billy Friedman. Uh, I had been to see... Uh, just by accident, uh, a film version that was a flaw of uh, Harold Pinch's play, The Birthday Party. And by the way, The Birthday Party uh, came in and out of my life several times because that's what the play was originally called. Uh, except Pinch wrote a play and it got out and became a hit. And then, before I know it, it, it was made into a movie and I went... I stopped in to see it one afternoon when we were looking for directors. And it was, uh, it all took place in a basement in one room. And then this guy just twirled the camera around the room and up and down. I thought, wow, who directed this? And it was someone named William Friedkin. So um, that started that. Do you think that? Uh, I personally think that the film is practically perfect, uh, and it actually affects the way I see other productions because it usually takes me about 10 or 15 minutes to say, that's not Leonard Fry, or that's not um, uh, Ken uh, uh, Do you think that the indelibility of the casting has also affected future productions of the play? I don't know. Um... I've seen productions with fantastic actors in them. Uh, not necessarily some of the replacements that went on and on for the thousand and one performances. I mean, I want to tell you that Richard Barber would closed the show after a thousand performances. And I said, oh, Richard, let me be Cher's um, let's, let's uh, spin a tale for a thousand and one nights. And so he said, okay, it was kind of the inside joke. So it's the show like 100,001 performances. Um, but um, at, at the moment, uh, and the internet can, I, I come to realize that send is the most dangerous four letter word in the English language. Uh, uh, there's a possible production of it in London uh, next year in the West End, and uh, some names are being thrown about at the moment. One being that you would know, I think, Samuel Barnett, who is nominated for a Tony for his extraordinary performances. Uh, yeah, in Twelfth Night, in the All Male Twelfth Night. And uh, I, it, there is this fanatic boy uh, who wants to be a playwright in Liverpool. I've never laid eyes on him. I don't know him at all. He writes me much, much too much. I don't know how he got my email address. But <laughs> anyway, um, he, he decided that Liverpool needed a production of this last <laughs> year. And um, he had found some people that were willing to back it and 
with somebody who was going to direct it. So he wrote me all this back, and I thought, well, I've got to uh, cut it off, but I, I don't want to, you know, kill the kid because he's so young and so green about everything. So uh, I said, well, you know, Nathan, that in, a, in an email back, that's not going to be possible. Thank you very much for all your enthusiasm about it. Because it's going to possibly be a production in uh, London, in the West End, and uh, I'm wildly excited that some actors' names have been mentioned who, who would be fantastic in it. One is a guy named Mark Gatiss, who is the co-creator, co-writer, and an actor in the 21st century version of Sherlock on BBC TV. He plays, he plays Sherlock's brother. He plays... Uh, What's his name? Mycroft Holmes. And uh, he'd be wonderful, Harold. And uh, so I unfortunately said, you know, uh, I think that, you know, they're going to go after Mark Gates and Samuel Beckett because of his recent Tony nomination and so forth. And then this boy, without telling me at all, proceeded to get all the producers' names with connected with the London production on Twitter and write to them uh, saying that uh, he, he could help out so much because he was such a great friend of mine. <laughs> and uh, I wanted Mark Gatiss and I wanted Sam Beckett. I'm not Beckett. I'm Sam Beckett. Beckett. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, then there's an, another guy that was in the History Boys called Russell Tolley. Oh, yeah. Who's, yeah, who's been, would be a good Donald. I'm uh, not uh, 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 Larry. So, uh, oh God. Then all the emails from the people who are putting up the money and producing it and directing it poured into ICM here and said, what the hell is going on here? Are we being preempted? And it was just shocking to me. And finally got settled, and the, the producer director in London wrote me and said, "This is the uh, the menace of uh, the internet now." Uh, he said, I, I, uh, "I I don't even know how you review somebody's uh, Facebook entries or Twitter entries, but you can. You can find out who they've uh, contacted." He said, "This kid writes." Famous people all the time. <laughs> some of them respond to him and some don't. But he almost sank the thing. <laughs> so I don't know why I told you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, just that the play continues to be done. Uh, and it's, it's been done quite a few times in London, actually. Mm. Three, three or four times in London? Uh, this would be the third. Always in the West End. I've never been done on Broadway. Um, and um, so uh, I, I, I was sorry and, well I mean I thought the, the slideshow was wonderful but the, there was a particular London poster that was awfully sexy and I'm sorry you didn't see that uh, but London's been very friendly to the play yeah. uh, you had revisited the play uh, in a sequel, Men from the Boys, yeah. in 2002, right. which has, not <coughs> as far as I know, been performed in New York. No, it has. Uh, what made you want to go back to the play in 2002, or uh, at that point, uh, almost 40 years ago? Well, after the success of the initial production, you know, I mean, Barr, Richard Barr, immediately came and said, you've got to write a sequel to this, right? You know, they wanted to make money and uh, make it quick. So I said, well, I can't. I mean, I, I don't know whatever hap what's happened to these people. It's only been a year, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and what a year. I mean, yeah. during, the, during the run, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, um, RFK was assassinated. And, of course, Judy Garland died, and we know what happened that night. Uh, so, um, 
I just, I don't know. I don't know when it overtook me that I, I had enough information on, on what happened to them. Um, but I started to write it, and when I did, the only person that bit was a guy in San Francisco who runs a gay theater there called uh, something in the National. The San Francisco Conservatory for something or other. I don't know. Anyway, he did a first-rate production of it. And uh, it was then done in Los Angeles the next year. But, you know, it, it, there's no way to uh, cause the sensation that the first one did. And I, I didn't even mean this to be. It, it's a rather gentle look at everybody and, and what, what became of them. Uh, I don't think anybody's interested in that. <laughs> you know, they don't tear each other apart, you know. Uh, there's no fun. <laughs> and well, it takes place, uh, Larry has died, right? So yeah, Larry, Larry has died. Has died. And it, it takes place at a quote-unquote celebration of life instead of a birthday party. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that uh, occurs to me is that the play... Um, uh, opened about two decades before the AIDS crisis mm -hmm. in New York. Uh, so this is a play that's not about AIDS, but in many ways it has become so central to this play because so many of the original cast members uh, were taken, the director. Um, so it seems that... Um, and Richard Barr. And Richard Barr, yeah. Uh, so it seems as though the play is haunted by AIDS to some degree. Would you say that that is? I never considered that it was haunted, but I just thought it was so tragic that uh, uh, I think eight of them died of AIDS, yeah. plus the director, plus the producer. Mm -hmm. um, God knows why I did not. You have written other plays. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> you've written uh, quite a few. One, actually, that I find uh, quite lovely is Breeze from the Gulf. Well, that's an autobiographical play, so you can, uh, I mean, not that boys, I mean, everything that I ever wrote, and that's not too much, six plays, uh, well, they're, they're really about eight, because there are two that are so terrible that nobody wants to look at them. Uh, they're in the trunk, and there are a lot of trunk plays, you know, uh, in everybody's life. Uh, and even the early ones, or, 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 you know, when I was 16, 17, 18, writing, writing, stuff about how much I want to get out of the set. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, what did you ask? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think in every American writer's life, certainly, there comes that time when you feel like you've got to write your family play. Um, and as Eugene O'Neill said, deal with your ghosts. So um, that was uh, a breeze from the Gulf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, oddly enough, that play got very good reviews. And uh, it was shortlisted for a um, drama critics award. Um, but it only lasted six weeks. And um, it had a fabulous, wonderful cast. Um, they were theater people. I don't know that you would know their names, but oh, an actress named Ruth Ford. It was a three-character play. Me, my mother, my father. Uh, Robert Drivers played mm. the central character, me. And uh, my mother was played by Ruth Ford and, a, and an actor named... Howard helped me out. Scott, uh, married to Ann Sheridan. Scott McKay. Scott McKay uh, played my father. <clears throat> so, um, uh, but six weeks, you know, uh, nobody was coming. And so they put up the notice, and then at that point, you couldn't get near it, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, the last week was completely sold out. But it's never been revived, and I think it's a I think it's a better written play, but it's not a sensational play at all. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, 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 
it's a uh, it's a tough play. It's a tough play. I mean, yeah, my mother was a a, 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 dr a real old fashioned morphine addict, and uh, my father was a real old fashioned alcoholic, which I became too. Uh, but fortunately, I went into A about 25 years ago, and he died uh, when he was 54. Um, and um, she eventually OD too. So. No, but, but so that's not you know I, that what you want to go to see tonight? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we open it up to the audience, a few other interesting uh, parts of your life. You were also a television producer for a yeah. number of years. How did that happen? And. Did you enjoy that transition? I did. I did enjoy it because after Boys, uh, you know, I was pigeonholed as, as Hollywood will do, that I was a uh, homosexual writer and that I certainly couldn't write uh, mom and pop stuff or heterosexual stuff. And uh, when my great friend Robert Wagner offered me actually it was Natalie's idea, to come on the show because the scripts were not very good. And he was afraid it was going to fail, and I guess it would have. Uh, I, I jumped at the chance, and then I became the producer of that, and I produced 92 episodes of it. it. The show ran a year longer than I was with it, but I was dead by the end of four years. Um, because there was only one producer. Now you see a show, I mean, the producer credits just never, ever, ever <laughs> stop. You know? It's co co producer, co producer. And uh, zillions of writers, and we had five people on staff, and I rewrote them. And sometimes I even wrote um, original show and had to do it quick. I mean, when the actors would get the next script for the next week and they hated it. <laughs> well, guess who had to write a new show over the weekend? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, and I loved putting on a mom and pop show, you know. Uh, this uh, heterosexual couple that were madly in love with each other. It was a fantasy, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It was a mystery show? Uh, well, it was, it was a rip-off. I didn't write the pilot, but an obvious rip-off of the Thin Man because they were uh, amateur sleuths, uh, millionaire amateur sleuths, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, who drove around in a Rolls Royce. And there was a, a mansion a week that we needed where, I mean, everything, everybody got killed in elegant circumstances. <laughs> and they had a house man who, God knows how he took care of this enormous place we lived in. <laughs> and it was played by Lyle Stander, who couldn't even see <laughs> where the bar was, which he wanted to find, I can tell you. <laughs> and I doubt if he could have dusted and made the meals that they had in the show. <laughs> but he was fun. Everything was fun about it. Yeah. Well, let me uh, open it up to the audience. Uh, welcome questions from uh, you all. Yes? Um, you told us where the title didn't come from. Where did the title come I have no idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't, because um, uh, people don't know today. I mean, because in my generation, uh, nobody remembers. I, I, I guess somebody remembers the big bands, remembers Tommy Dorsey, and, and um, uh, Harry James and, and, and all that. And they, you know, after every set that they played, they would, it was just a constant refrain. Um, let's have a round of applause for the boys in the band. I heard that so many times in my life, in so many movies, in so many uh, television things, that I think the alliteration of boys in the band became in, in, embedded in my brain some way. But the play had other titles. As I said, The Birthday Party was one. And uh, another one was uh, Somebody's Children. 
<laughs> Which he was always too down beat. <laughs> uh, and I don't know, I, I, I remember vividly one night being exhausted from work because I wrote a play in five weeks. Uh, I had to, I had to get out of Diana Lynn's house. Uh, so, um, I was just lying in bed, uh, staring at the ceiling and trying to think of a title. Because the birthday party had been preempted. It was called a gay bar at one time because the setting was going to be the gay bar. And then when I realized we couldn't have 10,000 extras, like a, a mass crowd on a, on, on a weekend night, uh, like in the movies, uh, that and simultaneously, Howard, my dear friend, Howard Jeffrey, uh, took me to a, a friend of his, whom I did not know at that point, uh, a birthday party for him. And I just observed all these people that came to the birthday party and what went on there. And I thought, my God, this is it. Let's get it out of the gay bar and into an apartment where a birthday party is going. How did Howard Jeffrey react? Uh, I assume he knew Howard was based, uh, Harold was based on him. Oh, indeed. How did he react? Did he? What did he think of that? Well, you know, Howard was an extraordinary person as witness, um, Harold, and I never knew. And uh, it, he uh, wouldn't come to see the play for the long. I said, my God, when are you going to come see that? You know? So he finally came to New York, or was working here, I don't know. He worked on a lot of Broadway shows. He, uh, you know, everything that Robbins did, he did. Um, in fact, the whole of West Side Story was so-called built on him. I mean, Jerry started, just took a studio and started um, working out the dance routines on Howard. Howard forever went around the world supervising every production of West Side Story and finding dancers. And he, I remember when he came in and told me one night, I found the most extraordinary guy. I'm going to put him in the Israeli company. And I said, oh yeah, what, who, who is it? And he said, I don't know, some kid named Michael Bennett. <laughs> so off Michael Bennett went to Tel Aviv. <laughs> Um, anyway, to answer your question about how did he like it, being mysterious the way he was, the way Harold looks at the photograph and does say, well, it's a photograph of him in a silver frame and there's an inscription, and Larry says, what does it say? And he says, just something personal. Uh, Howard was like that. So <coughs> finally, he came, came to New York, got on the see, ticket, he went saw it, met him afterwards. He'd said nothing about the show. And I couldn't stand it, you know, and I finally <laughs> said, well, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, after a pause, someday I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but he never did. <laughs> yes. Yeah? Yeah, um, how involved were you in the making of the movie? It's specifically, like, the choice of um, anything goes at the beginning. Oh, yeah, that was my idea. And then the choice of the choices and all that stuff. You know? Well, um, I don't know. Maybe the location manager suggested that Julius let us in to shoot. But, it, you know, in the script it just said it gave our in, the, in Greenwich Village. Didn't particularly say Julius. Um, but I had a lot to do with it. I mean, I was the producer. He the, uh, the, 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 that was, was that the play? Yeah. No, 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 no. That was so-called opening it up. <laughs> but I mean, we only opened it up for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> then it, it enclosed in, and it, it was um, Freakin's idea. I mean, the, 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 the movie is much darker than the play was. The play was played totally in white light and at lightning speed. 
and the laughs were just one on top of the other, on top of the other, so that you couldn't hear. Uh, and then when Friedkin got a hold of it, it all became so serious, you know. I got worried, really worried. But he said to me, uh, uh, you know, I, it was my idea because my friend Tammy Grimes had an apartment in the East 60s, and I thought her apartment was just like what ought to be my apartment. <laughs> Uh, because she had a well-appointed, but not over-the-top wealth or anything. And there was even uh, just a rooftop with tar paper and, uh, that she put some pots and plants out on. And that was her so-called terrace, where she'd go out and ha had a deck chair or two and would get a sun bath. And whenever she could, you know. And so um, that terrace that, that Michael and Donald are on prior to the party in the daylight sequences were shot on Tammy's roof. Yeah. And then when we turn the other way, it's not Tammy's apartment, but it was somewhat based on her apartment. It, her apartment was not two floors. That was just done for interest. Uh, uh, and also, I have to say that the, uh, the art director uh, came with great credentials. I mean, he had just done Midnight Cowboy, but let's face it, you know, Midnight Cowboy was all in these uh, wretched circumstances, and I wanted something that had some elegance to it. So, uh, we approved floor plans, Billy and I, and uh, then he used to began to work and rehearse on, on tape stage of the floor plans. When they started building it and uh, decorating it, uh, up was going this kind of salmon pink uh, wallpaper with gold embossed bamboo shoots <laughs> all over it. And I thought, my God, this looks like the restrooms at Pearl's Chinese restrooms. <laughs> uh, no way. So I had to talk with uh, John, whom I never cared for in the first place. I mean, when he came in for the interview about doing the thing, or whether he wanted to or not. It, he was riding high on the night cowboy. Uh, we also had the, the cinematographer from uh, the night cowboy for a week. Uh, one of Friedkin's uh, <coughs> idiosyncrasies was firing people. So we had three sound men on this. And, uh, you know, finally CBS came to me and said, Mark, we can't, you're not supposed to be the producer on this thing, you've got to get a grip. Uh, we can't let Friedkin go on firing sound then, we have to pay them off. Um, so, uh, we did something about that. Uh, but, uh, I was the one that was horrified by John Lloyd's work as it was beginning to take shape. And Dominic Dunn, was the uh, executive producer, and he had a wonderful taste. And I said, oh my God, come look at this <laughs> Madame Wu's <laughs> wallpaper. What, what are we going to do? And um, he said, well, the oddest thing, I, when I was coming down here this morning, I passed, it wasn't Slumberger, but it was some wallpaper fabric company with an S. Schroeder. Um, is there a decorator in the room <laughs> who would know? But it was a very fancy wallpaper. Uh, so, and he said, I saw the most beautiful and strange paisley paper and fabric to match. And I said, come on, let's get in a taxi, let's go. It was on 57th Street. And we went in, and I said, that's it. 
And they even had it, they had it in the window, and they had the woodwork painted that color of kind of mocha. And I said, oh, this looks so chic, like somebody who doesn't have any money would do. And the bedroom, uh, you know, it's all covered in mattress ticking. So again, it was like Michael didn't have any money, but he had some taste, and it, it, it would do it. Uh, so that's how that got into green mattress ticking on the, on the, the window curtain and, and the wall paint, or the walls that were lying in it. And so uh, we, we ran into, uh, I guess, still can't think of the name of the wallpaper, but it doesn't matter. I, I just said, oh my God, we will take every rule that you've got <laughs> and every last piece of fabric that you've got. And they said, do you want us to deliver it? And I said, no, we'll take it with us. And we loaded up a cab and went back to the studio and brought it in. And you know, I had had a chat with the art director and said, uh, you know, so long. Uh, uh, it may come as no surprise to you, but I'm not a pushover in some of the things. <laughs> so I had no uh, qualms about saying goodbye to this very rewarded uh, art director. And uh, they papered the walls, and it repapered the original you know, wall set. And it was a four wall set. Every, they, what they have in movies called wild walls. A wild wall means that they can be moved out and they're planned in advance to do that. So the whole of the, of the, the apartment all was the size of rooms. I wanted it to be real size of real rooms, but they were all wild walls that we could take out. I, it's with the exception, I think, of the structure where this, it goes up the stairs because that had to be anchored or something. But that's how it got to got the look that it got. And freaking, I was about to say, uh, when I decided that we needed to break up the space and uh, let them uh, close in, and the rainstorm is not in the play or anything, and I dreamt all that up, um, uh, I thought it would open, airy, fun, light-hearted birthday party, and then the weather would change. Mm -hmm. And as the storm came on, that they would have to go inside. And Billy said, yeah, I want it to look like a prize ring inside. Mm -hmm. So all those bullet lamps that get turned on, to focus on to what would be like a boxing ring. What was his idea? It all got pretty dark and pretty serious. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, yes, many of us saw your your uh, movie in the Midwest before we got to New York. And for me, just seeing any version of me on screen was amazingly wonderful. And it was who were you? Who am I? No, 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 I mean it's a film. <laughs> oh. Um, um, everybody. Oh, you were everybody. Both actually, at, at that time in my life, I was actually a, a married wannabe uh, bisexual. Uh, and so I was just, it was very helpful. But anyway, it also, for me, was very meaningful as a New York movie because it was probably one of my first urges of wanting me to move here. And I particularly loved the rooftop garden. Uh -huh. And I've spent my life trying to reproduce rooftop gardens. <laughs> uh -huh. you know. uh, but my real question is, if this had been made about gays in, let's say, Mississippi, God forbid, or St. Louis, or Chicago, or anywhere else in the country, how different would it have been if it even would have been considered something to it? Would it have been possible in 1968 or 67 to have made it? And if it had been made Well, I don't know. It's such else. an urban story. <coughs> it, 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 it has this gathering of people who come from everywhere. Well, the uh, gays not, came together in other yeah, parts yeah, of the country. Yeah, and I mean, not only did different types, which I got castigated for, you know, uh, assembling nine stereotypes, but, uh, you know, they all have their own background and where they're from. And... Uh, 
I don't know what's cut and what's not. How about about the the film at least had jettisoned a third of the play, uh, which was too goddamn talky anyway. Bob Moore kept cutting and cutting and cutting stuff <laughs> out, and I kept screaming, you know, the usual thing of <laughs> green uh, young playwright. You and then he'd say, save it for the printed version, and like an fool, I did. No. And now they play it. You know, I've been to ones that where it goes on and on and on and on. <laughs> so, so with this thing in London, I just immediately said up front that you got it not only changed, I know all the Americanisms that don't work in Britain, and you've got to not only change those, but like public school versus private school, that's just one simple example. Uh, but you've got to cut the play, oh my God. And I said, I've got to cut version. And then, you know, you guys can go, and, you know, if you, you want to add a little joke that's missing, whatever. <coughs> then uh, fine, but, you know, let's get it down, down, down like that. And the 2010 version, which was done, uh, you know, I don't know what it's called, environmental... The transport group. Yeah, the transport group where they invited an audience about this size, size to sit around the loft apartment. Um, well, uh, I've lost my train of thought. Uh, we had to cut it, you know. I mean, I wanted to really... It, oh, I know. They, had, they, they wanted to play it in one piece, which it can't because it, it, it overlaps. It doesn't stop. Uh, so we took out the intermission and therefore it was really chopped down even more. But you, nobody would know it because everybody was probably just like you, dying to go to the Blue. <laughs> right. uh, 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 actually, Joan, and then we'll come to Jenna. I, I just, I love this film so much. It is such an honor. Yeah. It's such a treat to be able to hear you talk about it. Thank you for being here. I, I do have a question for you. Uh, okay, please, please. but I, I, I'm also uh, very grateful that I, I started to count the uh, <laughs> female faces <laughs> and heads in, in, in the room. And I, I'm, I'm so grateful. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here's my question for you. I'm, I'm curious emotionally as a writer what it was like for you to write this play that was such a hit and this film that was very powerful but then sort of get caught in this moment of history, right, with Stonewall mm -hmm. and have this response of, you know, resistance to the film and then come back years later and, and the people are... Are, are sort of reclaiming it. What was it like to sort of live through all of those different responses? And what was that? How did, how did you feel? Um, well, I think I ran the gamut. I mean, we've heard Dorothy Parker's famous line, but uh, of emotions, not just from A to B, but from A to C. Uh, I don't know. As I told you, I, I began to drink far. Be promiscuous and run around the world. I made a lot of money, you know. I mean, I sold film rights and got the play. Played every country in the world except, I think, Spain for the longest time until Franco died. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was bad in Spain. And then once he was gone, they broke off. Uh, uh, Almodovar came in. Is that how you say his name? Yeah. And, uh, the play was played there, too. Uh, um, I don't know. I guess I was kind of, I, I, I was pleased beyond measure that it had achieved what it did initially. So nobody could ever take that away from me. Um, and I thought if I never do anything more, and I don't think I have, very much. Other than this, it'll be enough. You know? I remember that when Tennessee Williams, fantastic, 
past career began to go down, uh, someone said uh, to Gene Kirkham, I knew, um, about him losing it after mm -hmm. Night of the Iguana. Mm -hmm. And then for the next 25, 30 years, it was just a series of embarrassing plays. And he, she said, I don't care if he never does anything but write a letter to his mother from now on, if he will have given us or not. Oh, first of all, thank you. Um, you know, it took a long time for me to really understand how brave you were in doing this piece in that particular time. The coded theater, that kind of world of gay men in the, in the entertainment industry, which knew more than straight people did and could subtext everything, you broke that. You broke that code. You, you, you came out of the closet, in a sense. Were you aware what you were doing when you wrote the play? Yes, I was. And number two, and more importantly, is you wrote a play about friendship. And I, I think that gay men have a particular way of being with each other that most straight people never see. And you put it up there. And most of the flack I heard came from gay people, not from straight people. How did you deal with that? Well, um, I, uh, I don't... I haven't told you, but I mean, I know, I know, I normally say that it, it, it all clicked in my brain one morning when I opened the New York Times, and there was a piece by Stanley Kaufman that uh, it was in, written in 1964, and uh, it castigated the three major playwrights who were not named. But they were obviously Williams, Inge, and Olby uh, for disguising their experience, their homosexual experience, in heterosexual terms. And what? Why didn't they uh, come out and just write about it and stop all the? subterfuge, whatever. And I thought, well, you know, that's a damn good idea. And I think I could do that. And it, I, it, I ju it just took over my brains. And because I had had three failures to do, having to do with homosexuality, I wrote this screenplay for Natalie Wood in which she would play identical twins. Uh, it was called Cassandra at the Wedding. It was based on a book by Dorothy Baker, who was a, a bisexual writer uh, who had written Young Man with Lorne, if you ever saw that movie, where Lorne McCall plays obviously uh, a lesbian in it, but it's coded. And um, so by Natalie getting the chance to, to play both a heterosexual girl who's getting married to a man and her homosexual sister who is panicking because she thinks that the other half of her is really being chopped off. Uh, she got to run the spectrum of emotions, you know, and she loved the, the script. But alas, as I say, Daryl Zanuck at Fox, even though he bought it, um, didn't like it. And he used to send me memos, this is constantly, and he'd get another draft of the script and he'd send back, and all he would say is, too many dykisms. <laughs> <laughs> and then by the third memo, you know, when it would come back, still too many dikisms. We'd fall on the floor, Martin Manulis and I, the producer, at this new word, the dikisms. And I said, what the hell are the dikisms? <laughs> <laughs> in the, the play, in the, in the screenplay, you know. Uh, so that was a failure. I mean, that pulled the plug. Natalie went on to make, I forget what the heck she made instead. Um, 
Gypsy, I think, because uh, it was about that time, it was 62. And then, uh, as I say, I, uh, Dominic Dunn was the head, was the uh, co-head of a, um, there, were, there was a television group of four stars called Four Star, and it was I Lupino and Dick Powell and Charles Boyer and David Niven. And they started this television company. Uh, and, and they would appear in this anthology, one or the other, well, uh, uh, and it's quite a hit. So Nick Dunn was uh, the head of Four Star, and then he knew when I got kicked out of Fox uh, that I was at liberty, and uh, he gave me a six-month contract at Four Star, and I sat around. It was the same building. All I could content myself with in this dungeon or a place, he's the cubicles, you know, writing, was that it was the same place that Horace McCoy was trapped in. Uh, the author of uh, The Day of the Locusts. Uh, I thought, oh, God, isn't that right, Howard? They shoot horses. Horace McCoy, did you say? Yeah. Nathaniel West. Nathaniel West. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It was it. Both Nathaniel West and uh, the day they shoot, uh, the, the, what is about shoot a horse? They shoot horses, don't they? That's Horace McCoy. Yeah, both of them had been writers in this building. And I thought, well, if they could uh, survive this, I can. And I, it was on the old Republic lot. And I could look out my window at a slab of concrete that looked like it belonged in Brown's Chinese Theater. And there were Trigger's hoof prints <laughs> and Rory Rogers' boot prints. That was what was outside the room. And I don't know, I just took naps on the couch every day and got no assignments. And then finally, Nick called me and said, My God, come over here to my office immediately. Uh, we've got this pilot, and Betty Davis is signed for it, and she hates the script that was sent to her, and she's going to walk on Monday unless somebody does something to the script. And he said, I don't care what you do, just take it and camp it up. <laughs> and so I went back to my office, and uh, I stayed up for the rest of the weekend, two nights. And I completely rewrote a script called The Decorator, in which she was kind, well, she was just an ordinary decorator in it, but I turned her into a combination. I thought, what pictures did she do where she was really, um, oh, where the snappy dialogue came? And uh, of course, it was all about Eve and uh, the man who came to dinner. And I just sort of put them all together and gave her a sidekick, uh, who was Thelma Ritter. But uh, I thought, I'm going to turn this into a gay man. And I wrote it for Paul Lynn. Oh. And uh, so, um, you know, when I got the script back, well, on Monday, I, I, I staggered over the administration <laughs> and put the script on Nick's desk and went home and, and just slept, fell, fell into a deep sleep. I'd never heard the phone ring. Ever. But uh, he took the script over to Davis, who was in high dudgeon by the, this time, and she could be, you know, when she turned on you. Well, you can imagine. Uh, <laughs> so, she was really being pissy because she had a butler and she had the butler open the door for Mr. Dunn from Four Star and with the, the, the rewrites. And the butler said, Ms. Davis said for you to wait here. That meant the entrance hall on the straight back chair. And then he took the, the script into her in the living room and closed the door. And Nick just sat there and sat there and sat there. And he said, the first thing that I heard was gales of laughter coming from the other side of the door. And I knew we were in. And he said, then the doors were torn open. And she came out and said, who wrote this? I want to meet 
<laughs> and then they started calling me all day long. I never heard <laughs> And finally, about 9 o'clock that night, I woke up. And uh, we, didn't have, we didn't have answering machines. We had Sue's answer. <laughs> so I called my service. And there were 900 calls. <laughs> And they call him and I said, what the hell's happened? And then he said, my God, we've been calling you all day. Where have you been? Betty Davis wanted to, wanted to meet you. I said, Betty Davis wants to meet me? Yeah. Well, anyway, I had to wait. But I waited till the first day that uh, we had the, the, the reading of the script around the table. And that's when I met her. And uh, because she liked the script, she thought I'd saved it. And she liked me, and she liked to dance, and I, I could dance, you know. So Aaron Spelling, who was married to Carolyn Jones, they were they were producing this thing. He was part of Nick Dunn and Force, <coughs> and uh, just to make Davis happy, uh, we would do a double date, Carolyn. And Aaron, and Betty Davis, and me, and it was so bizarre. <laughs> and we would go to a club where there was an, a, an orchestra or a combo or something, so that I could dance with Davis and keep her happy. <laughs> Which wasn't too hard to do, to tell you the truth. If she was on your side, it, it was fine. She was the first person. Uh, who was a celebrity, who called me to, f to congratulate me on the success of Boys. Mm -hmm. oh. I think we have time for about oh, one yeah, or two I more questions. Oh yeah, I must have talked for ten <laughs> days here. <laughs> yes? Uh, I was wondering how similar the actors uh, in the Boys and Men film were to the roles they were playing in personnel. Oh, um... Well, the more talent that they had, the farther apart they were from, from, from the role. Uh, a couple of them, unfortunately, turned into the characters. And uh, one of them had a tragic end, and that was the guy who played the hustler. Because he... he he started out as a legitimate actor. He, he was on a, a TV uh, soap opera, and um, he actually got a Broadway play after Boys. He was in. Uh, he, he played an innocent young sailor in um, Melina McCurry musical version of uh, Never on Sunday. And uh, so, and he made a movie uh, that was a Roger Corman film, and, and it was low budget, but anyway, uh, he was in it. And things seemed to be going fine for him, but then they took a dive. And he wasn't very stable anyway, really, emotionally. And uh, the next thing I knew, he was cowboy. So that was uh, really coming a little too close to the character. But the others, I mean, you know, they weren't like it at all. Uh, I mean, certainly Luckinville was not anything like Hank. And, uh, and, and Cliff Gorman was nothing like Emory, and uh, not, neither were the others I can think of. Yes. In the uh, documentary Making the Boys, there's a lot of black and white video footage of what I'm guessing is the London product, the original London production with the original cast. Right. I was wondering how much more of that footage exists, and is there any I, chance for it? I never knew that that footage exists. Because it looks, it looks like they shot the whole play. Yeah, and you know, 
know, wherever that is, I have no idea because I, I had nothing. I mean, I, I, I know the people that, they, they were thrilled when they found those bits. Right. If there was more, I don't know. Uh, and I never knew that they existed at all. But yeah, that's Wyndham's Theater in London. And that's the, uh, you know, one was there. And one last question. Did I hear you say that three gay failures Oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't quite conclude that. Uh, there was Cassandra at the wedding, the screenplay of Fox failed, grew out, end of screenwriting career. Then over to television, Betty Davis, uh, that didn't work. Shot, can be seen on YouTube. It can? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it can, can. I think so. And, um, of course, they wouldn't hire um, Paul Lynn for it. That was just unthinkable to have a gay man. Because uh, I thought Davis and Lynn would just be hilarious. And they would have been, you know, just hilarious together. Um, so uh, they cast Mary Wicks in it because she, was, she had worked with Davis twice before in movies, and she certainly wasn't any threat in the looks <laughs> and the third? Uh, the third, what was the third one? Uh, there was another one. <laughs> and uh, then, then, you know, I was completely dumped and had no agent and had no income. It was a pretty desperate time when I opened that paper and saw Stanley Cummings. Peace. Well, thank you very much.